The public housing era in the United States has definitely left a certain legacy with most people. This legacy is one of poorly built homes that were a last resort to live in for those people who couldn't afford to survive anywhere else. Many subsidized apartment buildings, often referred to as projects for slang, have now been destroyed, and all that is left of them is a very complicated and notorious history. Pruitt Igo, the notorious housing project that once stood in St. Louis, Missouri, stands as a textbook example of failures in housing projects. It proves to us that high-rise housing units are not always the best solution to house the poor. But why did Pruitt Igo and other housing projects similar to it fail? In 1977, it was argued by Charles Jenks that the death of Pruitt Igo was an effect of things such as vandalism and the way that the buildings were constructed. Along with other critics, such as Brent Berlin, Jenks made an argument that architecturally the building was unable to sustain the living environment and that it had many design flaws. In a later argument put out by Elizabeth Birmingham, she openly disagreed with the arguments made by Jenks and Berlin. She stated that architectural flaws were not the seat of the problem, but they only did a justice to, re to reinforce it. The real problem, in her eyes, was the layout of the project, and what she referred to as structural racism. No matter the case, it seems as if the project was almost destined to fail. Rising crime, neglected facilities, and fleeing tenants would eventually lead to the demolition less than 20 years after being opened. After examining the case of Prude Igo, one can only wonder if all housing projects failed for similar reasons or reasons of their own. At this point, we can only look down at the ruins of what was once a hopeful vision and watch developers fight over the land and what the next step should be. And Cabrini, Cabrini Green, everything is mean and not Cabrini Green. You could try to walk through, but you won't get far, and you might get a hit with an egg or a jar. Bring, bring me, bring me. Cabrini Green is known as one of Chicago's most notorious public housing projects. Although construction of what is technically Cabrini Green did not start until 1942, the area where it sat has a history that goes back even further. In 1929, Harvey Zobah wrote The Gold Coast and the Slum, a book about a sociological study of the difference between neighborhoods on Chicago's near north side. In the place where Cabrini Green would eventually be built sat Marshall Field Garden Apartments, a low-income housing development that existed in the area prior to Cabrini Green. While taking a close look at this map of Chicago history, we see how even as early as 1931, before the homes were built, the area had a reputation for being a place of high crime. Comprised of the Francis Cabrini Row Houses and the William Green Homes, construction began on site in 1942. Francis Cabrini Row Houses were the first set of buildings to be built. These row houses were unlike the rest of the buildings in Cabrini Green in the sense that they were not high rises. When examining the failures of Cabrini Green, there is very little emphasis put on these row houses compared to the famed high rises that would follow. At this point, most of the residents were Italian, something that would completely change, as by the beginning of the 1960s, a majority of the residents would be black, and by 1970, Cabrini Green was almost entirely black. Situated right in between Gold Coast and Lincoln Park, two of Chicago's wealthiest neighborhoods, Cabrini Green was unlike any other public housing project in the sense that it was in such a wealthy area. Other projects such as Robert Taylor Homes and Rockwell Gardens were situated in less central parts of the city, something that would make Cabrini Green even more unique. Starting in 1957, the city built the Cabrini Green extension north and south. These high-rises were known as the Reds because of their red brick. The Whites, or William Green Homes, were built starting in 1962 and got their white color due to the reinforced concrete exterior. Even before the buildings were completed, many different issues started to arise. 
Upkeep on the building slowed down. Vandalism increased. Graffiti became a common feature on the walls. Windows were broken. Rats and cockroaches were everywhere. Elevators stopped working. And basic necessities became tough to come by. As violence quickly became worse and worse, it turned into a sometimes terrifying event to walk to and from your own apartment. Gangs were very much a part of everyday life, and many residents were forced to abide by the rules of whichever gangs were in their area. Stories of horrible crimes at Cabrini Green became frequent in the news. One of the most publicized criminal events at Cabrini Green came with Girl X. A young girl was found after being raped, beaten, and choked. She survived and her killer was found. He was found not to be in a gang, in which was spray painted on her, a fact that outraged many of the people in the community. Certain events, such as the assassination of MLK Jr., have been connected to the beginning of violence. On the day that Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, there was constant gunfire from windows of the buildings, something that would continue to happen throughout the existence of Cabrini Green. In one instance, two on-duty police officers were shot out of the windows while they were just on normal patrol one night. Stories like this just became part of everyday life. But could this all just be a result of structural racism in Cabrini Green? It would be difficult to expect any tenants to last long in housing where costs were being cut as frequently as these. In Blueprint for Disaster by Bradford Hunt, he comes to the conclusion that there are three reasons why public housing, specifically in Chicago, failed. The third reason being design. He draws many parallels to the argument made by Elizabeth Birmingham, and in his chapter, Designing High-Rise Disaster, Hunt references the obsession of politicians to cut costs, leading to nothing but flawed design in the building. So if Cabrini Green really is an example of failure due to structural racism, what does all that mean? And how is this an example of that? Example. What is it actually that is quote-unquote racist in this whole scenario? It is my belief, going off of the thoughts of people like Birmingham and Hunt, that building these buildings as cheaply as possible created the issue itself. And where the cost-cutting tendencies came from, is the carelessness of government workers to feel the need to provide the best possible housing for these people that in some cases they even viewed as lesser beings. Birmingham makes the case, and I agree completely, even in the case of Cabrini Green, that these places cannot be completely unsustainable due to the architectural design alone, but the lack of vision of those who were in charge of planning to truly create a sustainable environment for those who were supposed to live there. Once all of the pieces are put into place, it becomes very difficult to disagree with theories of structural racism being the seed of disaster in Cabrini Green. Cutting costs just led to poor living environments, which fueled violence, ultimately ending Cabrini Green. When taking a closer look at projects similar to Cabrini Green, such as Prude Igo and other projects, it is clear that structural racism played a role in the overall downfall of public housing as a whole. What seemed to be a bright and hopeful vision in American planning just turned out to be a poorly executed failure in public housing. Although the high-rises of Cabrini Green have all been torn down, the housing project leaves behind a legacy unlike any other projects Chicago has ever seen. All of the residents have moved on, whether it be to nearby condos, other places in the Chicagoland area, or even as homeless people. The area where the project sat is now experiencing transition, something the city calls its plan for transformation. According to the Chicago Housing Authority, the plan for transformation goes far beyond the physical structure of public housing. It aims to build and strengthen communities by integrating public housing and its leaseholders into the larger social, economic, and physical fabric of Chicago. The city has taken many steps. A target is being built in order to bring jobs back to the area. Small developments with things such as markets and movie theaters are being built. Gardens are being planted and many other things. 
It's hard to imagine a place like Cabrini Green once existed in this very place. But the memory will continue to exist as a mere bump in the road in Chicago history. God's on the I'll play these this whole knows the projects show. Look at it. It's a beautiful thing, ain't it? Yes, it is. You might ask, how can I love a place like this? Yeah, I'm feeling well. The projects is my address. This place taught me some shit that no school or university could 